Good evening and welcome to our 6.30 Bible study here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we are so very glad that you have made the decision to join with us for Bible study tonight. We don't ever want to take for granted that you have other options, or that, the, that you don't have other options for your in-person or your online Bible study, which is why we always want to pause and say thank you for taking the time out to join with us in our Bible study. We are going to be continuing our journey in the book of Ephesians, and so we're in a new chapter tonight, Ephesians chapter number four, and I invite you to turn with us in Ephesians chapter number four, uh, verses one through 16, as we prepare for our journey in that book, Ephesians chapter number four, verses one through 16. But let us also pause now for a word of prayer before we begin our Bible study. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight. We thank you, Lord, for watching over us as we slept last night. We thank you, God, for the strength you have given us to endure this day. Bless us now, O oh God, as we go through our Bible study, that you would open up our ears and our minds and our eyes, O oh God, and let us hear your word through our Bible study. This, O oh God, is our prayer in your son Jesus, the Christ's name. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter number four, reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, let us hear the word of the Lord. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of you, each of us rather, was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower part of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Amen. We pray that God will bless the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. As we discussed in last week's lesson, uh, well, I'm sorry, the week before lesson, we understand that Paul is talking to this church in Ephesus, and Paul is trying to get them to understand the value and worth that they have in Christ Jesus. But more than that, Paul wants them to understand how they can benefit the entire body of Christ. And one of the most important things that any of us can get into our understanding is the fact that we are part of a whole we are not just individuals out there living our own lives. We are part of a whole. We are all called to live out our lives in community and in conjunction with other people. And so we talk about this from Paul's perspective in Ephesus, looking at how he can encourage them, as he says in chapter 2, that we are one in Christ. It's important for us to understand that because sometimes we can have so much of a perceived division when we talk about different denominations, we talk about different days on which we worship God, whether it's Saturday or it's on Sunday. We talk about the modes of worship we have, whether it is a, um, a highly uh, active worship or whether it's a very uh, seemingly subdued worship. We talk about differences in the way we worship, but we're all supposed to be one 
body in Christ. So it's important for us to keep that in mind. And so we want to jump into our questions tonight that uh, we're pulling out of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Our first question, what is Paul asking the people in Ephesus to do? What is Paul asking the people in Ephesus to do? And this can be found in verse number one. Notice these words that Paul uses. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So the first question may be, what is the calling to which we've been called? What has God called us to do? What kind of uh, reception are we to give to God's call? We know that from the very beginning when God created Adam and Eve, he called them to be fruitful. Now, God says this in Genesis. He says, listen, be fruitful and multiply. And oftentimes people think that the fruitfulness was the replenishing of the earth with their children. But the fruitfulness was bearing good fruit. The multiplication was the children. There's a difference, right? You can, be, uh, you can multiply and be unfruitful, right? You, you can produce bad fruit. And so what God wants us to do is produce good fruit. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to produce fruit of love and patience and kindness, right? And so when, when Adam and Eve fail, uh, they then put into the earth this, this sinful nature that all of us are subjected to. But when Christ Jesus came, he, in that second Adam that he was, uh, did away with all of that when he died for our sins. And so when Christ Jesus died for our sins, there then came this calling, right, this new life. Because God says that if you are found in Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation. Old things have passed away, and we've forgotten about all that. For those who are watching Sunday, you recall that part of my sermon was about the weightiness of life. And oftentimes, one of the weighty things we have in life is our past. Sometimes we cannot forget what we've done wrong. We can't leave that in the past. It's difficult sometimes for other people to also forget what we've done in our past, but we all need to let go of our past Forget about what happened yesterday, push toward tomorrow. Uh, forget about the mistakes you made last month and push toward tomorrow because there's nothing you can do about last week except be better. There's nothing you can do about last month except don't do it again. And so what Paul teaches us is the fact that we have been called to a calling. What is that calling? Well, in ministry sometimes, we call that a calling, right? I've been called to ministry. But God calls all of us to live better lives. And so Paul says, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. The truth of the matter is this, if we be honest with ourselves, all of us were pursued by God. God pursued all of us in some shape, form, or fashion, whether it was through our parents' voice, whether it was through a neighbor's voice, whether it was through a school teacher's voice or a coworker's voice, God sent someone to give us the good news to let us know that he was out there looking for us and that he had a new life for us to live. And oftentimes we forget about that, that God called us, right? And God calls us to be better people. And the only way we can be better people is to embody the goodness of God. We cannot be better by ourselves. We don't have the strength. We don't have the capacity. We do not have the ability because we oftentimes lean to our own desires. We lean to our own fleshy desires. We lean to our own understanding. And whenever we do that, we are not being our best selves. But Paul says to the people in Ephesus, I am begging you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now, the truth of the matter is also this. None of us have earned salvation. None of us can earn God's forgiveness. None of us can earn his grace. It's a free gift. Jesus gave his life freely. He died on the cross freely. He came to give us life that we might have life more abundantly. But even in that giving, he says, now I want you to live. Right? I want you to live. I want you to be better. Imagine this. What if you had run up uh, credit card debt on a credit card to the amount of maybe $10,000. You just kept charging and trying to get yourself back in, in, in the right posture and things happened, you couldn't pay the bill. $10,000 charge. What if when you went to the bank one day to make a payment on it, 
the bank officer said, hey, this gentleman over here has just paid your entire credit card debt off, right? You didn't ask him to, but he did it. Of course, we would all celebrate. We say, praise the Lord. Thank God that someone has been that kind. Now, the question is, what's your next step? The wrong next step is to go and run up $10,000 more dollars. Some folks say, well, it's cleared now, right? The right next step is to live a life worthy of what you have just received, a new lease, a clean slate, a new opportunity. And so that's what Paul is saying, really. Live a life that is worthy of the calling to which you've been called. We've been called to a life of holiness. Now, holiness does not mean that you are perfect, but holiness means that you're going to be separate, set apart, to be used by God. And so God calls us sometimes out of friendships. He sometimes calls us out of situations. God sometimes has to force us out of situations that he knows are bad for us because he, he knows that they will not allow us to live a life worthy of the calling of God's sanctified life he wants us to live. And all of us can do this. All of us can live it. How do I know? Because God has never given up on anybody who wants to be better. Look at the Bible. You'll see people who did awful things. Moses killed a man, and God went and used Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Okay? Paul was a murderer and was on his way to murder other people, and God stopped him on the Damascus Road and called him to live a better life. Jacob was a liar. Jacob lied so much he tricked his brother out of his birthright by swapping with him a bowl of soup for his birthright. And then when his father was laying on his sick bed and couldn't really see, Jacob put on some wool clothing like an animal and went in and told his father he was his brother Esau. He was a liar. But look what God did. God used Jacob to be Israel. He changed Jacob into Israel and, and, and sent him on the right way. Rahab was a prostitute. But God used her to lead the people of Israel to take over Jericho and to bring that city down. What's my point here? All of us have a past that God has looked beyond. All of us have situations in our life that God has said, I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about your future. And so what Paul says is we need to live a life that is worthy of that calling. Live a life that is worthy of the second chance you've received. Live a life worthy of the second and third and fourth or the another chance that someone said to me, God's not a God of second chance. God's a God of another chance because another chance keeps on coming up, keeps on coming up. So live a life worthy of that calling. That's what Paul wants us to do. He wants us to do some good work in the earth. He wants us to live a life worthy of that calling. To that end, Paul begins to talk about the fact in verse 7 that each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift, right? And so Christ gave us grace that extends to our lives, and that measure of grace is enough for each of us. Some folks get more grace because they need it. Some folks may not get as much grace because they don't need it. But any amount of grace that we get is what God knows that we need. Second question tonight, why were we given different gifts? Now, in other books, Paul has talked about gifts of the Spirit, and he talked about love and peace and joy, and also the gifts of giving and the gifts of healing, the gifts of speaking in various tongues. Uh, but he says there's one Spirit that gives all these gifts to be used in God's church. So the question is, why do we have different gifts? Why can some folks do some things, some folks do other things? Notice the gifts that Paul talks about in this particular chapter. He says in verse 11, the gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers, right? And so the question remains of a verse number 11 and 12, why were we given different gifts? The answers can be found in verse number 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, Unto all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. To equip the saints for the work 
of ministry. So why did God call you to be a Sunday school teacher? Why did God call you to be an usher? Why did God call you to be a steward? Why did God call you to be a trustee? Why did God call you to be in the lay organization, the missionary society, the YPD? Why did God call you to be in the choir? Why did God call you into any of the ministry of the church to do room in the inn, to do our meals on wheels? Because God wants you to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. We're not given gifts just to make ourselves look good, but we're given gifts to build up the body. We're given gifts to pour into somebody else. We're given gifts to expand God's kingdom. We are not here just to hold our gifts, right? And I say, God, I didn't want to mess it up. And, and so I held on to it until you came back. The Bible speaks about a parable of a man who gave different gifts or different talents to his people. And to one, he gave one talent, and someone else, he gave multiple talents and and third one he gave even more talents well the one that had the most talents went out and and the bible says he expanded those talents uh, the second one had a few talents went out and expanded those talents but one person had one talent he said i'm gonna go and bury my talent i'm gonna go and hide it and when my master comes back i'm gonna dig it back up and when the master came back he said hey here's the one talent you gave me he said you should have gone out and multiplied that talent. You, you did nothing but just buried it. You didn't make full use of your talent. Yes, I know you only had one, but I gave you one basically because I didn't want you to worry about the fact that you didn't have two or three or four, but focus on this one talent you had and use that for my, for my, uh, for my work. Some of us have buried our talent. God has given you a gift and you have sat on it. God has given you a gift and you have not used it because you're afraid the enemy has come in and put fear into your life, but I've come by to let you know you don't need to be afraid of using your gift. Whatever gift God has given you, he is fully equipped and prepared to multiply the use of that gift. Whatever gift God has given you, maybe you have the gift of administration. You can come in and help our various churches or, or nonprofit organizations get their books together. Maybe you've been given the gift of giving, and you can do fundraising. You can give folks to give money and encourage them to, to give other things. Maybe you've been given the gift of hospitality, and you can come be a greeter, or you can come work, work in the usher ministry, or you can help people find their way. Whatever gift you have, use that gift rather than sitting on it and say, well... I don't want to encroach upon anybody else's territory. No, no, there's enough work to be done in God's kingdom. There's enough work to be done in, in God's churches that we all can use our gifts. And the gifts are there for what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith. That's why God gives us our gifts, so we can build up the saints for the work of of ministry. All right, final question. What does Paul say our responsibility to God is? What does Paul say our responsibility to God is? Verse 14 and 15 give us an answer. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. Wow. So Paul says we got to grow up. Right? That's why I love every Sunday when we have our Decalogue, we talk about what the greatest commandment is, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And when Christ says, and on these two commandments, depend all the law and the prophets. He's talking about all the books of the law and all the writings of the prophets, right? And so he's saying everything that they taught depends upon and hinges upon these two. But then we go further and we repeat what we believe in. We repeat our Apostles' Creed, right? We say we believe in God the Father Almighty, right? And Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, right? Who was... Uh, crucified, dead, and buried, right? Rose again, third day, ascended to heaven, sits on the right hand of God the Father. That's our belief structure. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus, his only son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. 
We believe that he was wrongly tried by Pontius Pilate. We believe he was born of the Virgin Mary. We believe he committed these acts of, of miracles and healing. That's what we believe. And you have to know what you believe because some folks will come along with unsound doctrine and deceitful scheming to get you away from what you believe. That was the first trick of the enemy. He went to Adam and Eve and basically said, what did God tell you about that tree? And because they were not firmly rooted and grounded in their belief about not eating that tree, they believed his lie. But I want to encourage you today, you got to know what you believe. You have to know that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. That Yes, he was born to, to Mary and Joseph. Yes, he lived a life that, that was pleasing and obedient to God. Yes, he hung on the cross for my sins. He bled out of his body, blood and water. He was buried, but then he was resurrected and he lives and he reigns with God. You need to know that, that he sent back the Holy Spirit to teach us all the things that, that Christ Jesus had taught us, but also to remind us of those things. You need to believe that you will have life and life more abundantly. You need to believe that you are not just being happened upon by life, but God calls you to happen to life, that God calls you to be uh, one who has an abundant life and that God has blessed you with certain gifts and graces. Don't believe that because you were born in a certain zip code, that you were born in a certain parents, you're born in a certain city, that you don't deserve the best in life that God has for you. Do not believe the lie of the enemy that God does not have a destiny for you. You need to be firmly rooted and grounded in what you believe because other than that, you'll be blown away by every doctrine. It is not sound. You will be carried away. But at some point, you got to grow up and be firmly rooted and grounded in what you believe because it is that belief that will get you through hard times. It's that belief that will allow you to flex your faith and say, no, I'm going to stand firm upon God's word. When Job got his first piece of bad news, when his children had died, he said, well, you know what? I'm going to still trust in God. When his business was gone, he said, listen, the good Lord giveth, the good Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He wasn't just saying these things to make himself feel good. He wasn't just saying these things to appear as though he was having faith. When his body got racked with pain and his health started to fail, Job stood firm in his faith and said, all the days of my appointed life, I'm going to wait here until my change comes. He was saying these things because it was part of what he believed. He believed that God was not going to leave him in his state of misery. He believed that God was not going to give up on him. He believed that God still had healing in his hands. He believed that God could restore everything that was taken away from him. It was his faith that kept him. Same thing with Joseph. When Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, he still believed that God was going to bless him. When Potiphar's wife lied on him, he still believed that God was going to bless him. When he got forgotten about in the prison, he still believed that God was going to bless him. And yes, indeed, God kept his word and God got him out of that prison. God allowed him to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh and he became second in charge in all of Egypt. But it was his faith that kept him firmly rooted because he knew what he believed. He wasn't going to be carried away by unsound words from other people. And you also, and me also, we have to know what we believe so that when the waves come in our lives, when the storms come, we can be firmly rooted and grounded, anchored, and know that God will indeed keep us and God will indeed bless us. All right? Well, I hope that uh, this lesson tonight has blessed you in some way. I hope that you have learned something more about the human condition, something more about the character of God, and maybe something more about the particular text that we are reading. And I encourage you to join us for our prayer call on tomorrow. Also, join us for church school on Saturday. And certainly, please join us for Women's Day on this Sunday. Our preacher is the Reverend Dr. Uh, Chastina Archibald, former Dean of the Chapel at Fisk University, and I believe the apparel for Sunday for the women is pastel, so uh, please encourage you to wear your pastel colors. Men, if you want to, wear your pastel colors too, uh, but that's the apparel for Sunday. We want to pray for our Women's Day committee and, and all the work they've put into getting us to this very good day. Let me encourage you also, please stay safe out there. Keep wearing your mask. Keep sanitizing your hands. Keep being socially distanced when you can. Uh, be aware of your surroundings and make sure that you're not getting into situations where you might just uh, end up contracting COVID-19 because of somebody else around you who's not being as careful as you are, all right? Until next time, it is my hope and prayer 
that God bless you and keep you, that he make his face to shine upon you, that he let his countenance uh, be upon you and bring you peace. Until next time, that is my prayer, that God bless you and God keep you.